Welcome to Experience Talks, a radio magazine for the experienced listener. I'm John Semper, Jr. Hollywood is awash in masked superheroes these days. For many, it's a sign of the death of the movie industry. But perhaps that's an overreaction. After all, masked heroes have been a staple of the cinema since its earliest days. Take, for example, arguably the greatest masked hero of them all, El Zorro, the fox, the fictional masked rider who fought for the oppressed during the early days of Spanish California of the 1800s. Created by author Johnston McCulley in 1919 for the juvenile pulp magazine All Story Weekly, Zorro was first brought to the screen in 1920 by silent film star Douglas Fairbanks. Fairbanks would repeat his role five years later in Don Q, Son of Zorro, and more movie incarnations of Zorro would follow over the course of the next four decades, played by actors like Robert Livingston, John Carroll, and Reed Hadley, just to name a few. But for those of you of a certain age, like myself, there really was only one true Zorro. Out of the night, when the full moon is bright, comes a horseman known as Zorro. This bold renegade carves a Z with his blade, a Z that stands for Zorro. Zorro. The fox so cunning and free. Zorro, Zorro, who makes the sign of the Z. In 1958, Walt Disney brought Zorro to life in a weekly TV series on the ABC network. It was a brilliant depiction of the character, as portrayed by charismatic actor Guy Williams, later known as the patriarch of the Robinson family on Lost in Space. Disney spared no expense, and the show boasted a production value and quality of storytelling unlike any other program on TV at that time. For my impressionable young mind, it was the purest example of how to bring a masked hero to life with dynamic excitement. Many years later, I would apply much of what I learned watching Zorro to another hit TV show for kids, Spider-Man, the animated series, which I produced for the Fox Network in the mid-90s. But for one young actress, the Zorro TV show was more than just a great depiction of a masked hero brought to life. For Suzanne Lloyd, playing the role of Raquel Toledano in Zorro, opposite cast members Guy Williams, Henry Calvin, Gene Sheldon, and George Lewis, marked the beginning of her prolific career in television and film and being in the show was a somewhat spiritual fulfillment of what she had only just realized was her true calling. Here is my conversation with one of the stars of Walt Disney's Zorro, Suzanne Lloyd. Suzanne Lloyd, welcome to Experience Talks. Thank you. You grew up in Canada, correct? Well, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, yes. I was born, raised, and educated in Toronto. Um, and I moved down to the United States when I was uh, 18 years old. And I wanted to go to uh, an American university. My father was an American. My mother was a Canadian. And you're allowed to um, inherit your father's citizenship. So that I didn't have any trouble whatsoever uh, moving down here. Mm-hmm. And uh, it never occurred to me to uh, go into acting. I mean, nobody in the family, nobody I knew was an actor or an actress. And uh, God knows I went to enough movies, but it just never crossed my mind. And when I got down here, I really, I was really kind of lost. And I, you know, I started university and I, I couldn't connect. I felt like I was kind of a fish out of water. I loved being here. I wanted to be here very much, but I was, I was really lost for quite a while. And how did you end up discovering acting? It was kind of a, from what I read, it was, it was sort of a, spiritual experience you just sort of arrived one day and said wow this is it and so how did, how did that come about it was wondrous serendipity um and i'm deeply grateful i met a, a young woman who did want to be an actress and she was going to audition for a play at nathan and ruth hale's uh, theater in the round in glendale called stage door and uh, I started reading it one day before we went to lunch and then she loaned me the play and i finished it that night 
and um, I called her and asked her if, if I could go with her to this thing called an open audition, and she said, sure. And she said, you can't come in with me probably, but sure, you can come with me. So I went to pick her up the next day, and she said, you know what, I'm just not going to go. And I was, I mean, I was so disappointed, I can't tell you. So I said, I'm going. <laughs> she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, I read this play, and I love this play, and I love this girl, Terry Randall. <clears throat> She's extraordinary. And I said, I'm going to go to the audition and see if I can get something in the play. And she said, you're crazy. And I said, I know. How do you get to Glendale? So she told me how to get, and I arrived at Glendale, and I parked. And there are kids all my age and older, and they're like, all over the block, around the block, waiting to do this audition. And how old were you at this time? Uh, I was like 22, 23 okay. at the time. And um, I, it was funny, it was my turn. And when they asked me which part I wanted to read for, you know, I found myself saying Terry Randall, which is the lead. Now, here's a kid who has no experience, has no idea what she's doing. Just, I've never been as happy as I was standing in 103 degree sun in Glendale waiting to do this audition thingy dingy. So when I get in and I, and I read, and um, I was in there for really quite a while, but I've never been to an audition before, so I don't know what's a long time or not. I was just there for a while, reading with different people. And then they gave the Terry Randall part to somebody else, and they gave another part to me. And I can remember my heart sinking because somebody else was going to do this girl that I, that I had fallen in love with. And uh, anyway, I left and um, realized that that was probably one of the happiest experiences of my entire life, and I was joyous that I'd had it, and I got a call that I got the lead. So my mother said to me, how are you going to remember all those lines when you can't remember to conjugate your French verbs? And I said, Mother, it's really different. <laughs> when you really are joyous and you really love something, it sticks. But that's, what's fascinating to me is that you had had no acting training, mm. And you didn't really even know if you'd be able to memorize lines. And yet, not only did you get the lead role, but you, did, you, know, you were able to do the lead role. I mean, you really, you know, you got through that experience and, and clearly got through it with flying colors. There's, there's, um, there is a certain <clears throat> magic. I get very um, kind of weepy about it. There's a certain magic in life, and if you're lucky enough to find the thing that you're supposed to be doing, it's like you're not doing it for the first time in that you have an... I had an understanding of what I was doing that hadn't been taught to me, and I was very aware of this the whole time that um, my heart and my, my soul were involved in this, and I had an understanding of it. So I didn't experience fear. I experienced this heightened joy and excitement the whole time, and I realized that in that period of time, Somebody had granted a wish that I didn't even know I had. <laughs> wow. So from this experience, you actually got your first job, correct? Did it, were you spotted by a casting agent? Or how did it come about that you got your first? Well, the thing that I didn't realize was that um, one of the studios, Disney Studios, um, had sent their head of casting to this theater to look for young people to put in their television series that were becoming very successful. So this man came on a regular basis. Every time a new play opened, he would come check it out. And um, he sent a card backstage, and, and he'd written on the back, call me. And, um, and the, one of the, the actresses that was there said, you must take this very seriously. And so I called him the next day, and um, he asked me if I had an agent. And I said, no, this is the first thing I've done. And he said, well, you better get one because we'd like to test you for Zorro. Well, I, 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 I was stunned. I mean, I've never been in front of a camera. I've never been in a I didn't, I, I didn't know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how to do anything he was going to ask me to do. And somehow it didn't bother me. It excited me, the fact that I didn't know what I was walking into. I didn't have a clue. It was exciting. And I didn't doubt myself. And I have to say that's the first time in my entire life, once I found acting, I didn't doubt myself. Mm -hmm. I got the best training in the world. Once I finished at Disney, mm -hmm. I got the best training in the world because I knew I was working on animal instinct and, and just and, and I and I knew. So after after that I studied. While I am gone, my dear, I suggest that you occupy my quarters here. 
Give up your suite at the inn. I will feel better about it, my dear, if there is a garrison to guard you. Oh, you're such a handsome man. And you get such funny little wrinkles in your forehead when you frown. Someday, Arturo, you will be a big, important man, and I will be the grandest lady in all of California. You will see. Now, what's fascinating to me, first of all, the seven-year-old in me gets chills at the very mention of the word Zorro because uh-huh. this was one of the most important TV shows in my life when I was growing up. And even at that time, I was able to um, see the difference in production value. The production value of Zorro was really quite special. Mm-hmm. That, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Disney poured a tremendous amount of resources and time and energy and money into making Zorro be just one of the finest things on TV at that time. What I find interesting is that with so much writing on this, and it was the first season of Zorro that you were a part of, and you, your role was not insubstantial. I mean, it was, it was a very important role because you start out as the wife of the Commandante, uh, and we, we think that you're just sort of going to be there to play off of him, but in, in, uh, as it progresses, it turns out that your character is part of this vast conspiracy to take over uh, California. But a miracle happened yes. because I was only supposed to, I was signed for two episodes. I was going to ask you if, if, if you knew this in advance. So. <laughs> no, no, I was signed for two episodes. Yeah. And um, the day that I was saying goodbye, that I was the last day that I was shooting, and, and uh, I, I realized that I'd been given this incredible gift, and I'd probably never be given this gift again of working with all these people, and I'd never be at Disney again. And uh, I, I didn't know anything about how to plan a career or, do, you know, really do anything, and, and I didn't really know how to act. But um, <laughs> so it was, it was like 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm and I'm trying not to cry because everybody else is professional and they're all going to be back the following day but me. And the executive producer, Bill Anderson, came down on the set and uh, I just said, thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. This has been wonderful and, and leaving is really going to be heartbreaking. And he said, what do you mean? You're not leaving. And I said, yeah, I am. This is my last day. He said, no, it isn't. We signed you to do the next four. Wow. <laughs> Yo, well, this is my first show. You have to understand. I don't know what I'm doing. Buenos dias, senora. It's so early for a lady to be out. May I speak with you for a moment, Senor Quintana? Oh, si. I have something I would like to show you. From the eagle? The sign of the leader? Until further notice, you will take orders directly from me. Take orders from a woman? You will take orders from me or you will be replaced by someone who will. Si, Senora. Be ready within the hour to move the shipment of gunpowder that arrived last night. I will give you specific instructions later. There's a slight problem, senora. What do you mean, a slight problem? Well, the shipment arrived. We stored it late last night in the cellar, but it uh, turned out to be brandy. What are you trying to tell me? Where is the gunpowder now? I don't know. I think somehow Zora got it away from us. We found our man unconscious in the cellar. He didn't know what hit him. You would be fortunate, senor, if you could get off as lightly. See, I, I must have time, senora. Give me 24 hours. Give you time, you say. Senors, there is not time. The entire plan of operation depends upon every man doing his job and doing it on schedule. It will not be so easy for Zorro to hide all those kegs of gunpowder. We might find him if we move quickly. All right. Round up all the men you can trust. I can twist that stupid sergeant around my finger. I will get him and his lancers to help you smoke out Zorro. I don't even know what a key light is. I, I, I had a Tootsie experience on set with the um, director. And when he sat me down for the first shot and they, did, they were doing a close-up mm-hmm. on me, and then he says, look, camera left. And, of course, I look, the, I look left and it's not left. And he goes, no, 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 look, camera left. And I looked the wrong way. He says, have you never been in front of a camera before? And I said, no. And he said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, come with me. So he said, this is your key light. And when you're in a, when you're in a tight close-up, I'll tell you, when in a close-up, you don't move very much. In a medium shot, you do this. In a long shot, you do that. Are you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. He said, okay, that's your first lesson. I'll help you as we go along. And you, he did. He helped me all the way through. You were being mentored, I'm guessing, by the great Norman Foster. Yes. What a brilliant director. Yeah. Yeah, and he was wonderful. He was a sweet. I loved him. He was a stickler for um, the time period and the um, the accent and the uh, mode of dress mm. and, uh, and and everything. Everything had to be accurate. Did you have any trouble with the accent? 
I'd never done an accent before, so again, I called one of my friends who from the stage door, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, somebody told me that you know how to do accents, and she said, yeah, and, and we're on the phone now, and so um, I said, well, what about Castilian, and she said, yeah, that's a sibilant S, because the king had a lisp, and so everybody had to speak the same way. So I said, I got a little recorder. We, can you just say my lines? I'll tell you my lines. She said, sure. So anyway, she gave me the lines, and I, I have a fast ear, I found out. I didn't even know I had a fast ear at that time. <laughs> but I picked up the accent really quickly. Uh -huh. So we get on set, and Norman listens to me, and he goes, cut. And I got, oh, no, you know, I don't know where my key light is. I know my <laughs> accent's wrong. So, but I'm not scared. Uh -huh. I think I'm going to be fired, but I'm happy as a clam because I made it this far. <laughs> so he said, I don't like your accent. And I, and I thought, oh, my God. And he said, you sound too, like, Middle Eastern, like you're from Israel or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what people sounded like from Israel. I'd never met any that I knew of. So he said, I want you to think about it and come back and we'll do it again. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I can think about this all day, but I don't know exactly what he's talking about. But the only thing I could think to do was just not make it so heavy. Just cut, cut back on that. That's... So he called Guy and he called Henry and he called me and we were offset. And he's sitting with his head down and his, his hand, his head in his hands. And I'm looking at him thinking, he's, he's having a conniption fit very quietly. He said, let's hear the dialogue. And so we do the dialogue of the upcoming scene. He said, right, Suzanne's is the correct Castilian accent now, and I want you two to match her accent. Wow. And I thought, I'm dead. I'm dead because now these two professional actors stars in the series have been told to do something that a total novice has done that doesn't know what she's doing. It's like the teacher's pet. They're going to hate me. They're going to hate me. And this is going to, they were wonderful. They were what they were kind. They were wonderful. They did not treat me like um, a total inexperienced kid, which I was. They treated me like I was an experienced professional actress. Mm. I, can't, I remember it like it was yesterday mm -hmm. because I, I was so grateful mm -hmm. at the kindness that they exhibited to me. So, of course, I loved them all. <laughs> a moment ago, senora, out there, you risked your life saving mine for that gracias. They planned to kill me anyhow, but, but you, why didn't you escape when I gave you the chance? I've made such a mess of my life. I've ruined so many things. I don't deserve to live. You know, I've talked to, uh, because Zorro is a particular favorite of mine, I have talked to other members of the cast, and they've made, uh, they've gone at, to great lengths to say that they felt that it, it, on the set, it felt like a giant family. Yeah. And everybody was really... Uh, nice. Tremendously nice to one another. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. They were very <coughs> polite. You know, the first, the second ADs, all the crew, they were very polite. Mm -hmm. uh, and I noticed that. I mean, I'm from an English background, so manners were always, you know important to me mm -hmm. and um, I don't think that any set that I was ever on there was such you know genuine gentlemanness towards women mm -hmm. as at that uh, studio so you're really you went to uh, acting university 101 yeah. right on the Disney lot yeah couldn't and, have been a better place and I'm thrilled and excited because you were right in the middle of all the Zorro-ness of it all guy in his costume and having sword fights and swinging from ropes. And I, I mean, quite a few of your scenes involved action. You were there in the tavern drinking wine with Sergeant Garcia. And uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's just a wonderful experience that you started out with. Well, that was exciting because we got to watch the rehearsal. And um, I got to um, have an understanding of how stunt people work. And it's very much like a dance routine. And, it's, and they call it marking. And it's like one, two, three, four, like sword up, sword down, parry, thrust. And then for the take, they speed it up. And it's bam, 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 bam. Mm -hmm. And when they speed it up, it's like when you have your heart in your throat because, you know, a fall move and somebody can lose an eye mm -hmm. so uh, and to and to watch the sword fights were the most thrilling thing for me the other thing I wanted to mention about Disney because you said his production values because I'd never really been on a sound stage before when I walked to the back lot and I saw this this Spanish village 
I thought it was actual buildings that you could, uh, real stores. When I opened the first door and there was nothing there but the outside, I was shocked. It was all facade. Mm -hmm. I was really in Disneyland, really in Disneyland. The magic of the movies. Yeah. And now I have to ask, years later, because that Zorro village sat there, you know, up until the 80s, I believe, or maybe early 90s, really? when they when they raised it to uh, oh, God. to put a parking structure. Oh, dear. Um, but you could still see it from the freeway if you drove by on the, on the five, uh, did you ever glance over there and, and, and see any of that scenery, that Zorro it's village? It's probably a good thing I didn't cause I probably would have burst into tears and not yeah. being able to drive. I, I mean, I, I would have, I mean, that set meant a great deal to me. It was yeah. some of my happiest days were spent on that set. So from Zorro. Because that was such an important role, and the, and the camera spent a great deal of time on you. You became such a pivotal character in that, in that particular story arc. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful showcase of your ability. So coming from that, what was your next step? So, you know, eventually Zorro did end. You did have that last day on Zorro. What next for, for Suzanne? My agent took me on an endless series of, you know, <clears throat> look look sees, whatever you call them. Come in, say, how do you do, and leave. They are totally depressing. And uh, I thought, all right, I'm never going to work again. This is the end of it. And I'm de deeply grateful, but I'll just never. And then. And how did you find the agent? Uh, just to step back a bit. Oh, my God. Again, you know, I called the girls from the show and I, and I said, w what agent? Who should I try? And they gave me a list of three or four. And um, I called them and they weren't interested. And I called a man by the name of Alec Alexander. He represented Salminio. And I thought Saul was a wonderful actor. And um, I called him and I told him what was going on. He said, I'm not coming out to some theater in Glendale to see an amateur performance. And I thought, oh my God. He said, if you'll bring a scene in and do it in my office, do a monologue, and I said, what's a monologue? <laughs> so he said, just put a couple of scenes together and that you can do by yourself without anybody. So and I said, he knew that you had done Zorro? No. Oh, he didn't. He, he was the one that, that I had to get him before they would sign me to Zorro. Uh, okay. I didn't have an agent. Got it. So I had nothing. That's why he was saying, you know, oh, he probably got 100 calls like that a day. Mm -hmm. But I came over and I did the scene, and um, that was fine. But I think it was because I, I had the scene. They were doing a screen test. They were testing me. Mm -hmm. And so he had nothing to lose, mm -hmm. you know. And I heard him say that... And somebody quoted him after I'd been with him for two years. He said, if he had about five more like me, he could retire early. Mm. <laughs> so mm. <laughs> so I, I served him well, I think. So you have the agent. You finish Zorro. He takes you out on what we now call meet and greets. Okay, meet and greets, yeah. And, uh, and what was the next job for you? I got a, a call to read for Lux Playhouse opposite Ann Baxter. Wonderful. And uh, the character was very dark. And I loved it. I really loved it. And uh, I think I must have been back three or four times to read for that character. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked when I got her. I was shocked because I, going back so many times, I thought, mm -hmm. anyway, I got that. And then after I got that, um, my agent got a call from Warner Brothers. They had seen the Lux Playhouse. Mm -hmm. And I got a call to read for Ida Lupino. Mm. And I read for Ida Lupino, and uh, I didn't get that. I ran into her like three or four years later. She said, damn, I wanted you for that part. I thought, that was so sweet. <laughs> but I did get a Sugarfoot opposite Will Hutchins. Oh, yes. Yeah, where yeah. I played a Gitano. Oh. Again, with the accent, but not the Castilian. <laughs> so there, there's a, there are certain recurring themes in your career that have already begun. First of all, you play these incredibly beautiful women who have got this <laughs> something evil going on. Oh, yeah. Some kind Hopefully. of evil streak. yeah. Uh, and uh, and also, um, you know, exotic women with accents because that would you would you would play that a number of times in a number of different. Uh, TV I did, shows. but it wasn't it, it wasn't a uh, <coughs> dominating. The accents weren't a dominating factor. I right. was very fortunate. Uh, I grew to realize because being very dark and with dark eyes and 
and my skin was more olive when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, I could have been uh, cast in a certain way, mm -hmm. but I was not. And I wasn't always cast as this dark woman either. I mean, there were roles I played, you know, young mothers, and mm -hmm. and I I and I, I played the social registry too. I mean, I played an Appal Appalachian uh, woman opposite Clue Kuliger, who, when I met him, I thought was one of the finest talents I'd ever met. I called every casting agent I had met at that time and told them to check this man out because I thought he was a fine, fine talent. Mm -hmm. I was with Michael and Sarah on my show with Clue, mm -hmm. um, all the way up to the social register. Well, Raquel Tol Toledano was, you know, of the manner High born, class. you Absolutely. know, very much. Yeah. All the way down to an Appalachian woman, destitute Appalachian, gun-toting woman, mm -hmm. you know. So I was not typecast. And I would, and, you know, I didn't, I think in retrospect, you look back and you realize all this. But at the time, things are moving so quickly and you're just so happy that you're being hired. Mm. And I took everything that was offered to me. Everything that was offered to me, I wanted to do. You said in an interview once that um, one of the things you enjoyed about your career was that you got to play many different kinds yeah. of characters and many different kinds of people as opposed yeah. to just one yeah. character, you know, in a, in a recurring role. Um, starting with Warner Brothers, I mean, you, you were on virtually every major mm -hmm. Warner Brothers show uh, at the time. You did um, uh, Maverick, yeah, uh, opposite James Garner, I assume. No, I was with uh, with Jack. I, I did most of the Warner Brothers shows uh, two or three times. And then at Universal, Universal was a big supporter of mine. I found out CBS and ABC were big supporters of mine. I found uh -huh. this out in retrospect, you know, years later. Uh -huh. I, 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 gee, I wonder why, you know, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's wonderful to hear that people had a belief in you. And it was the first time in my life I had a belief in myself. That's and I was oh, so grateful. It's great. Now you did, just to clarify, you did eventually get training and you trained oh, under yes. an incredibly talented actor. Do you want to talk about Jeff him? Corey? A bit? Jeff Corey. Jeff yeah. Corey. Oh, if I can just not cry. Um, <laughs> I went to Jeff after I completed Zorro, and um, I told him that I didn't know really anything about acting. Um, and I said, I know he's full. I know everybody's trying to get in here. But um, would he consider me? And I can't remember if it was just on the interview or he gave me a scene to read. I don't remember, but I wound up in his beginning class. And uh, he handed me the really tough stuff, you know, like Hat Full of Rain, all the really serious, heavy stuff, which I loved. And again, it was on Animal Instinct I started, and then at the end of the scene, Jeff would talk to us, and he would tell us, talk to us about choices. And I, it was, it just, it was like I was hearing this information that I already knew and it was affirming what my gut was telling me to do mm -hmm. this is like follow your bliss follow your dream people because it's just actually there's a line in well goodwill hunting when she asks him how do you know about math mathematics he said i just understand it like mozart understood the i just and it's just that you just get it mm -hmm. you know and you get it fast and mm. you get it through your gut you really were a natural in. Whatever it was, whatever mm -hmm. that channeling that channeling was, I'm just deeply grateful that during my lifespan I found out about it. And that's our show for today. This Experience Talks was produced by John Semper Jr. and me, Cynthia Friedloeb, along with production guru Stan Mizrahi at KPFK FM Radio, 90.7 in Los Angeles, 98.7 in Santa Barbara. 93.7 in San Diego, and 99.5 in Ridgecrest. You can get more information about any of our guests, and you can listen to previous shows on our website at www.experiencetalks.org. Thanks to Engage Executive Director Tim Carpenter for making this show possible, and thanks to you for listening. 